Thank you very much. My name is Luca Fasoli. I here in Western Digital for quite some time now, or almost 20 years if you count all of the acquisition. I'm VP of, uh, oops, sorry. I'm VP of the memory product solution team, and I work in the silicon uh, technology and manufacturing team in Western Digital. My boss is Siva Sivaram, uh, he's the EVP here at Western Digital, and a <coughs> pretty well known, I'm assuming many of you know him. Uh, what I'm going to discuss today, what I'm going to talk about today is technology. And what I'm going to talk about technology is technology at Western Digital, and specifically technology in the flash world. And technology by itself is not an end. Technology by itself is an enabler for product that our customer can use. And delivering the right technology at the right time, at the right cost, and for our customers and bring value to our customers, what we are passionate about and what we're trying to do now. I'm not sure why it's keep blinking. So again, forward looking statement. I'm going to say things that might or might not materialize. So uh, please be aware of that. And let me tell you a little bit, what are the four components that we at Western Digital are really focused and we believe we have and allow us to uh, achieve the technology edge. First one is we have technology leadership. I think uh, my previous talker has discussed a little bit about the advantages of that we have in NAND and HDD. I'll actually open the hood a little bit into our SSD product and show you a little bit more what we are doing in our SSD product that allow us to say that we have technology leadership. Secondly, we have vertical integration. We own all of the stack as we build technology from silicon all the way to the system. We can decide at any point in time where to make the optimization, what is the route to optimization to go, because our engineers are, work, are working not in two different companies, but in the same company, and can optimize that. Third, we have the manufacturing muscle to do that. We have um, HD factories, we have SSD factories, we have Swiffer Fab, we can put all of them together and quickly deliver the, product, the right product that the customer needs at the right time, at the right volume, and the flexibility that is necessary for our uh, uh, customer to be successful. And lastly, I want to point out one critical thing. We have a joint venture with our partner, Toshiba Memory Company. This joint venture has been with us for 20 years and counting, and is one of the most successful joint ventures that we have seen in the storage industry. And it has been delivering consistently technology innovation over and over again. And I'll try to show to you, I'll try to show to you over history what are the key innovations that we have. Uh, can I, can I ask please. a question? Um, we see a huge amount of investment coming in to this part of the industry in terms of manufacturing of the componentry. How do you keep up with the amount of money that people like the Chinese can put in, you know, they, they, in, the, in South Korea? They just seem to be investing huge amounts of money. And is, is this a capital-intensive business that's hard to keep up with? So thanks for the question. Um, I can't comment what other people are doing in the industry. I can only say what we are doing here at Western Digital. Here at Western Digital, we are very focused on doing the right investment so that we uh, right-size our industry for the market needs. And that's our target, and that's what we're planning to do. Okay. And our, as I said before, what we are focusing on through these four components, we are focusing on delivering the technology solution at the right time so that we can deliver the maximum value to our customer. And that's really our key focus. And now let me go into open the hood a bit under our products and describe what is the fundamental building block that uh, we use to build our flash products. And what we call it is we call a charge trap device. And a charge trap device is not a new device. It's a, it has been invented several decades ago. And it is a very simple transistor. And the way it works is a very simple way. We have a charge trap player where uh, charge gets stored. And we ch change the threshold of the transistor. And we have a way to read the threshold of that transistor through the gate. And we can decide what state the transistor on. The innovation that Western Digital introduced some around, sometime around 2013 or so was to actually turn this transistor upon, on its head by 90 degrees, stack it upon each other into a cylindrical confined cell. And by stacking multiple layers of um, transistor on top of each other and processing it in one single step, you can actually cut the cost of building one single transistor at a time. And those provide the, the right cost benefit for our uh, customers. 
And one of the key things, as you look a little bit deeper and you look at the single cell, you can see that the cylindrical confined cell has a fundamental advantage over a 2D cell. The reason is that the field gets focus. And when you have focus, the gate has full control over the charge trap layer so that you can promac the transistor much, much, in a much finer way. And also you have control over the channel. So you can read whatever you program in the transistor in a much better way. And this cylindrical confinement which makes this cell really uh, attractive and versatile and powerful. This is the most cheap semiconductor device of all time. By the end of this year, there's no matter how many transistors we have shipped, transistor the industry has shipped, no, many, no matter how many resistors, how many capacitors, how many DRAM cells, this is going to be the most cheap semiconductor device in all time. And I was listening to NPR not too long ago, and they were having a discussion about how many part, uh, sand particles are there on, the, on Earth. And they did some calculation, and again, you can always guess it. But if you trust their number, we, West Digital alone, by the end of this year, in this year, would have shipped 10x that number. 10x that number. This is the amount of devices that have been shipped. Let me now go a little bit into the detail and how you can use this transistor to build effective products that are beneficial to our customers. The cylindrical confinement allow us to control the threshold very, very closely. And what we can do is, of course, you can throw a bit in there. You have an array state. You change the threshold. You have the second state. You can store four state in it, which means you store two bits. You can store three bits in there. And this is really the workhorse of the industry. That's where most of the industry, most of the bits, 3D bits that are being shipped in 3D. And let me remind you that in 2D, 3-bit was really the most that you can do. Only in one time in 2D, there was an X4, a, a 4-bit per cell device, which was actually uh, done by um, SanDisk in 2009. And you can see that in that parent, uh, in that product release, 2009, there's the first 64 gigabit X4. But that wasn't on the right time, and that wasn't the right technology. In X4, we can act in a, a big technology, which is a tar trap device, you can actually store 16 uh, states which means four bit per cell. And this is a tremendous and powerful way of scaling the cost of your, uh, of your, uh, of your bit and provide benefits for the customers. And I don't know whether any of you has been at the International Solid State Circus last week. We actually presented a 1.33 terabit device, X4, uh, that was developed in cooperation with a partner Toshiba. And we have that technology. We actually uh, showed uh, an X4 um, uh, device two years ago at a, at a different conference as well. So this technology is here in Western Digital and will deploy to the customer whenever he thinks the time is right. So would you characterize the QLC as consumer grade flash versus enterprise or is it just a question of semantics or controllers or? Uh, so, you know, at the end you, we build products and we try to make sure that whatever we meet the spec product, and by uh, Western digital ability to move where we do the innovation and to change the way we partition the various system, we can actually think about uh, X4 in different way depending on how you operate it. Now, one thing I want to point out is that as you go from X4 to SLC, you can actually trade off different things. And as you trade off different things, you can make a very fast cell, for example, on SLC, and then use QLC to store device. So you can think that in a QLC device, you can actually partition your device in different sections. And you can actually- So the same, same electronic technology can support SLC or QLC depending on- The same, the same fundamental cell, the same charge trap device can be made to behave in four different ways. And that can happen in different customized dyes. So you can build a die that is extremely fast, optimized for SLC, that's fast and has for high endurance. Or you can actually, within the same die, partition the memory in different behaviors and then optimize for <clears throat> power. And then you can use your system, your system, by the knowledge of what the the, the product needs to do, decide where to put the data. So and we do that 
in Western Digital day in, day out. This has been in our product almost since day one. So are you saying that you're using a universal process with these cylindric cylindrical confinement, and then you can decide based on what the customer requires, you can build a QLC, a TLC, or whatever else? That's correct. That, that's it. That, that is correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, let me show a little bit what uh, uh, Western Digital has done over the past year. So we actually started in 2013 with a 24 layer. That was our test chip. It was just internal. Nobody has seen it. Only our engineers have seen it. It was just for us to learn. 48 layer is when we believe, what, where we believe we could make a product out of it. But we, while the rest of the industry was focusing on ramping up 3D technology, we knew this was not cost effective. And this is why we actually have a very limited production on 48 layer. Where we re and we were focusing our effort more, mostly on developing 64 layers. And 64 layers is where we went and decided, this is not decided, but where we determined that this is where there's going to be a cost crossover between 2D and 3D. And we latched 3D in, in volume. Um, in 2017, and this was the, has been the workhorse of the industry and of Western Digital. And right now, the large majority of these of the bits are actually uh, uh, three, uh, 3D bits, and the large majority is 64 layer. And a year ago or so, we introduced the 96 layer technology. This is it means 96 layers stacked uh, on top of each other, and we were the first to ramp. We ramp uh, a year ago or so, and um, we have been quickly transition several of the products uh, from 64 layer to 96 layer. And of course, we're working on one and XX technology. And again, for my uh, uh, Jim, right, that, stayed, that was at the ICC, I also had the honor to attend another paper from Western Digital on a 128 layer circuit under the LA technology. So constantly, Western Digital has shown that we can innovate, we can be at the forefront of the technology development, and we can uh, provide uh, technologies. When those technologies get to product, this is something that we think really hard, and we want to make sure that our technology provides values to, for the customer. It's not technology for the sake of having technology, but it is technology to provide value to the customer and technology to, to provide some sort of uh, solution to the problem that the customers have. And I want, now I want to pause a minute and run a video, um, if my computer skills allow me. Uh. So this is a video of a true model of our 96 layer technologies. You can see in the middle is the memory. If the memory hole with the charge trap device right there, you can see all of the feature side. And now you can see how deep it is. I get vertigos as I look at them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And this is an actual real model where you can see it. And I was a pause, pause one second and tell you a little bit about this green thing. This is not an artifact. It's not that we wanted to do, the, do, it, do, the, do it look pretty. This is exactly how it looks like if you were to open up um, a device. The reason we do that, we actually build this in two tiers. So we first build the first set of floors. Then we move the crane up, and we build the second set of floors. One of the key issues that you have as you drill this hole where the memory comes through, you have to be very steep. You can imagine that if you have just one degree of variation and you're trying to open up the hole together at the bottom, at the top it opens up. And now you have to compensate for that variability by increasing your die size. We at Western Digital have decided to do it in two steps. We dig the first hole, we build the next building, and we, we, do the second, the, we build the second floor. And I want to give, please. Oh, um, so it's a, I don't have a microphone. Yeah. So it's a 90, it's 96 layer, it's 48 plus 48. No, but it's a 64 layer string. Sorry? It's two strings and 64 layers each. It's two strings of 48. For 96. Yeah, for 96. Oh, for the 96, yes. but okay. But is this 96 or 128 there? This is 96. Oh, it is, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, we can count them, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, so is, is that going to allow you to go from, let's say, 64 to 128 to 256 to 512 in, a, in relatively a, easy increments? It's, 
Well, e there's nothing easy in this yeah, world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but because you've, you've chunked it into 64 layer yes. chunks, you could potentially just build on top of that as many of those as you want? So, there, yes, there, there are, so first of all, you, you want to build as high as possible, but you also need to contain the cost. So it's a good trade-off between how many times you repeat this process right. versus um, how many layers you do at one time. But we see that this technology, this charge trap based technology device um, that is um, uh, based on our BICS technology has the ability to scale for the foreseeable future. Mm. And the two tier is a key piece of technology. And I wanna go back to what I said before. If you do a one tier, so one single drill, you have to open up the die size. If you do two, you don't. So that's why it would allow us to keep the smaller die size, the, 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 the smallest die size in the industry as compared to uh, other charge trap uh, technology manufacturer. Can you tell us what that, what, what that difference is in terms of the die size? I can comment on that, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can find it somewhere. Okay. No, I, I got a micron. Yeah, the, Jim can tell you all of the details of it. Okay. Uh, one thing I want to point out, drilling two tiers. So <clears throat> I once had to dig a hole at my home and the wall was too thick. And I had a drill bit that was only half. And uh, I didn't want to go to Home Depot, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> so I drill one on, a hole on one side, and then I move to the other room and make all of the measurement and drill a hole on the other side. And thinking about measuring it. So the next time I had to go to Home Depot to buy patch and paint, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because I had too many holes. So this type of, this is exactly the type of technology that we have. You build the first layer, you deposit all of the, you build the first floors, you deposit all, everything else, and then you drill a hole, and you have to match every single hole on top of each other. And you do it 1.7 trillion times per wafer on a 96 layers. So our engineers in Yokaichi, they're doing this day in, day out, 9,000 wafer a day, uh, and they're doing this on and off. So let me now move back. So, so in order to scale to more uh, so you've got the SLC, MLC, TLC, QLC kinds of things. But if you're going to add, if you want to go from 1.3 terabit to 2.6 terabit kind of configurations, are you going to add more layers per section or add more sections? And I'm not sure I've got the right terminology. We're going to do both. Ah. We might be doing both. Again, I, don't, I can't disclose what we're going to be doing in the future. And is QLC the end point of this, or is, is there a, a 5LC, 6LC? Yeah. Kind of? So, <laughs> of course, we, we keep looking at it. The, the startup device is extremely flexible extremely, and extremely good. But at a certain point, you get to a trade-off between what performance can you afford to have I thought that was MLC, but apparently I'm wrong. Huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you have to think about it. When you go from 2-bit to 3-bit, it's a 33% cost improvement. When you go from, go from a 4 uh, from a 3 to 4, 3 to 4 is 25. Yeah. 4 to 5, it starts to become lower and lower and lower. And you're, you have to really kind of understand what is the right trade-off. And at what point in time you can build the right product that have some, some, chance, some, some, some chance of solving problems for the customers in the market. Look, I have one question. I'm not yeah. sure it's the right place to ask it, but the industry is moving away from NAND to storage class memory kinds of things. Do you see uh, Western Digital, Toshiba moving in that direction, or, or how does that play out? I, again, I don't know that I agree with that statement that the, moving, the industry is moving away from uh, NAND to storage. I think Let's say they're introducing a new technology. Yeah, I, I can't speak to other technologies that other people are introducing. What I can tell you is that we believe that the charge trap device that we have can fill, and actually you gave me a great introduction to my slide, uh, next slide, so can I just, let me just right move ahead. forward. There you go. This is exactly maybe what you're referring to. These are well-known storage technology. You have the DRAM on top, you have the HDD on the bottom, and you have NAND flash in uh, green, uh, in, in, in dark green in, in the middle. That is a TLC device. 
And over time, you can see the cost reduction. DRAM has stopped scaling. HDD, as you know, we all know, continues to scale and continues to show with all of the advances that Western Digital and the industry have done at a pretty much 15, 10 to 15% year over year through aerial density improvement. And then Flash is actually uh, still more expensive than HDD, but still continue to scale as HDD. But we believe that as, flash, as the, with a charge trap device being so flexible and being able to cover different type of application, we can actually create customized devices that are very fast. And they, have, you know, they are in the microsecond range type of access time. And that can provide some gap between what the DRAM world is doing and what the traditional mainstream uh, X3 NAND is doing. And so this is our vision, view of the world, that the, the, there are a whole set of applications that can be enabled by the same fundamental technology, the same scaling, the same cost scaling, the same basic technology as uh, uh, Max was saying, that will help us uh, 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 enable new application, even in areas that are not traditionally mainstream. So that's, that's really our position. And if you look at, you know, on a different scale now is access time versus <clears throat> cost per die, you can see that each, the cost, yeah, cost per gigabyte. You can see on the right side you have the HDD, on the top side you have the DRAM that somewhat has stopped scaling, and in the middle you have a spread of potential products that you can have. Some of them can start to be closer to DRAM, and some of them can start to get closer to HD. Never reaching HDD, though. And never reaching DRAM. Um, yeah, I don't want to reach the cost of DRAM for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, yes, please. Okay. I just wanted to uh, give an answer to Chris. I finally looked the thing up. And the uh, Toshiba, before you put the logic underneath, I forget what you call that. <coughs> CUA. OK, you call it Cirque, CUA, Cirque too. Under the OK, fine then. Yeah, because I know Micron calls it that. But uh, I'm comparing a, um, a Toshiba chip that doesn't use that. 64-layer, uh, uh, 512 gigabit part, and that's about 132 square millimeters. Micron, who used CUA for the same number of layers and everything, is 111. So it's about 20% uh, die savings. It's, it's really important because 20% size translates to something larger than that from a cost standpoint. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jim. So uh, uh, planar versus 3D, is that? No, 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 no different planar versus 3D. Yeah, that's that's putting that's that's whether you have the logic that runs the memory array off to the side of the memory array, like almost everybody does, or if you tuck it underneath the memory array, I got you. then you save twenty percent by tucking it underneath. Okay. So Jim is speaking about the circuit and the array technology, and again, that's a technology that we have shown it. Actually, if you look it up, in two thousand and two, a company that was later on acquired by Western Digital. <laughs> Uh, deliver product having circuit under the array already with around 400 million worth of uh, revenue in 2002. That was the uh, matrix uh, company. Yeah, but um, we have that technology. We have shown that the ICC. We will introduce when we, the time is right. When we believe it is, uh, it's the right time for the customers. Right. So actually, um, a number of the flash companies, uh, Samsung and others, have uh, uh, created a higher speed flash yep. capability, and you guys are doing that too. Yeah. Um, and competing against things like uh, 3D Crosspoint. Where do you see the demand for that? Uh, uh, do you think, uh, well, in one versus, what's the advantage of one versus the other? So I, I can't comment on Crosspoint. I, it's not a technology that uh, we have available, so I can't really comment. I, I can continue to go back to what I'm saying, that we believe the charge trap device delivers, can cover a wide range of applications. And as you said before, there are applications that are focused on, uh, there are, uh, you can make dyes that are very fast, very uh, fast and can start to uh, uh, approach, um, uh, address um, applications that are close to what DRAM is doing. Um, you know, how exactly it's going to play out, it remains to be seen, in my opinion. Okay. Let me go back to my, and switch gear a little bit. Um, I think um, 
Ryan speak be spoke before about the vertical integration. I want to get a little bit more in detail into it. We have HDD and SSD together as the two companies, Western Digital and Sandisk, came together. We actually had a lot of sharing of technical and engineering um, uh, knowledge. We have shared all of the manufacturing capability, and we are now have smart, smart manufacturing, applying machine learning, artificial intelligence to do that. And lastly, of course, there's a continuous combined scale of an investment from the two companies coming together. And we use that to generate a vertical pyramid of um, uh, innovation, uh, starting from assembly, controller, firmware, product test and validation, and system integration. And this vertical pillar, it would enable us to, to build what we call platform. And these platforms, they're actually customized to our customer, customized to our to customer center. We have retail, we have client, we have enterprise and mobile platform. Those platforms are feeding into this platform, you have the NAND memory technology, and then Using that platform, we, generate, we, we produce flagship product, a, pro, a product like our uh, Western Digital Black, which I'm assuming many of you know, and a product like the SN6300 that we are, 63, uh, 630, that we are uh, disclosing today and we're going into details today um, from, our, uh, from my f uh, f uh, fellow um, uh, colleagues. And Going back to the question about when is the right time to introduce the technology, this is a graph that shows cost comparison between various technology nodes, starting from 2D. 50 nanometer was the most cost-effective 2D technology. It was uh, uh, where, we produce, where we had a lot of products. 48 layer, as you see, dotted line, is not, was not cost-effective, and we only did a minimal production to get the learning. And in 64, when we knew that 64 was the right technology, sorry. Oops, I'm sorry. When we knew that it was the right technology, we actually converted several products, and uh, we had actually a lot of different products that are being converted. And now that uh, 96 layer came about, we're actually transitioning most of our 64 layer product into 96 layer products. And I can show that to you in this graph where you can see that uh, one Z, we had 40 plus product lines being converted. 48 later was very limited production, 10 product line. We ramped our 64 layer technology and had more than 60 product line. And then we're now in the process of converting our product portfolio from 96, 64 layer to 96 layer. And I spoke about the manufacturing scale. I, we have, uh, manufacturing, our manufacturing master span across the back end, which is the fab, and the front end, which is all the assembly and SSD. And this is our Yokoichi complex. It's a mega fab. It's not five different fab. It's actually one single fab in which wafer go back and forth. What you see in orange there is a high-speed train for wafers. Wafer takes a height. Mm -hmm. They go back and forth. If you have a empty equipment on fab five, you'll get right away a wafer from Fab 6. If you, a wafer that starts in Fab 3 will not know whether it's going to end up in Fab 2, Fab 6, or Fab 5, because we optimize the global level. And on top of it, our, manif our development center is right there. So when we develop technology, they get developed right here, and the same engineers are engineers that get them to production. Where's and Fab this, 1? Huh? <laughs> Where is that one? Uh -huh. The empty spot. The development center is right here. Oh, OK. <laughs> So uh, the, the, the and because of that, we have a fundamental advantage on how fast we can go from one technology to the next one. Right. Because we develop it, we take it, and we transfer it. And to give you a sense of how big this fab is, I'm gonna, I, we took an image of a stadium. And we try to fit it, and you can actually fit nine. So you can play a lot of football game in there. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't care about the equipment. And another, to give you another sense of the scaling, so I have a 3D, I have a 3D wafer right here. Uh, you can see how thick it is. So if you were to put it down on the floor and put, stack all of the wafer that we produce in one year, Question is, how tall would that be? 
Ooh. No, oh. Lord. Okay. <laughs> this is the Eiffel Tower. This is the tallest building in the world, Burj Khalifa, in Dubai. <laughs> Any guess? It's Mount Fiji, as it's appropriate, the fab in New York H, and not quite there, <laughs> but close. A little bit less than that. And now, if you really want to get to the top, it's around Mount Kilimanjaro. So, <laughs> wow. this is how many wafers, you know, this is not that thick, and I can pass it around if you guys want to check it out. 96 layer? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's printed, but really, really small. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Carefully have to ship that. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so where are the uh, holes being drilled here? It's yeah, it's holes. <laughs> and I want to spend a few minutes on the uh, partnership with Toshiba. We have uh, a unique partnership, 19 years and counting. We started one gigabit, one gigabit. And we are now, now, you know, as presented yesterday, uh, last week, 1.3 terabit. If you do the math, it's a 1,300x improvement of the density from one, from, uh, from um, uh, in the same silicon area that you have. And this is really translating into cost advantage for our customers. And this is a very successful joint venture that we have. Can you believe it could scale for another Dozen generations or something like that? You're predicting here, Luca? Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not paid enough to make that Apparently. prediction. But <laughs> we, we know the charge trap device is a very scalable, it's a very robust device that can scale over time. And, uh, and uh, there was a, there's a big, a big change in scalability for this device from planar to 3D. Yes. I don't see any like fourth dimension that you can bring into bear at some point. <laughs> well, the fourth dimension is the number of bits per, uh, per Yeah, I suppose. So, and then the other dimension is performance trade-off, endurance trade-off. You, uh, you can trade off different things. Because the cell is so versatile, you can trade off it's building a custom die, or you can trade off building, um, uh, you know, die. doing it within the same die or within the same product, or combining within a product. Uh, both different dyes of the same basic flash technology. The key point is the basic technology, the hard, the hard uh, task of drilling the holes and matching them 1.7 billion times, we know how to do it. <laughs> yeah. How you use it in product, that's really up to the imagination of our Western digital engineers. And so let me conclude here. Um, I'm running out of time. Um, we have the lowest NAND cost, at least for, 90, for 96 layers. We have uh, led the ramp and productization of the 96 layer 3D NAND. Charge trap, as I said before, is versatile and scalable. And we have vertical integration here at Western Digital that allow us to optimize at every uh, sca a stage of the transition between one discipline to another. And that allows us to give uh, our customer the right product at the right time and at the right cost.